Thank you so much for joining us today, both in the room and online. We're so glad that you're a part of the service today. Well, today we're going to continue our series called The Secret to a Happy Marriage. And uh, in this series, we began last week by talking about commitment and how important it is to be committed to God and to each other. And uh, today we're going to continue the series. Next week, you don't want to miss... We're going to talk about conflict resolution next week. Now, I realize nobody here in this room or nobody watching online has ever had an argument or a disagreement or any kind of conflict in your marriage. So maybe this isn't for you, but make sure to bring somebody because you know somebody that has had conflict in their marriage. And we're going to talk about God's way, the biblical way to handle conflict. And um, so, not all conflict is wrong. You got to learn how to navigate this. And so, very important. But today, we're going to talk about a very important topic. We're going to talk about communication. Communication. How husbands and wives can communicate not just better, but biblically. What does the Bible tell us about communicating? with each other. We're going to read today from 1 Peter. And uh, for those of you that have studied the Bible, you know that Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and uh, he became a leading apostle. And we know that Peter was married. Uh, We don't know if any of the other disciples were married, but we know that Peter was married because it tells us that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Now, I don't know why a man would have a mother-in-law without a wife, okay? So we know that Peter was uh, married, and he writes to us this incredible, uh, important way to communicate with one another. Now, I believe the Bible is inspired by God, that it is our standard for practice. It is what we are to follow, what we are to do. But I believe that also Peter put some practical things for us to understand how to communicate better in your marriage. So begin reading with me in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 12. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure Conduct. Let me just pause and make a comment here. Um, the Bible, first of all, is uh, what we're to follow in every aspect of our life. You know, sometimes cultural, uh, culturally, people disagree with what the Bible says. But if you begin to dig and to understand what actually was being said, inevitably, without any exception whatsoever, we find that God's way is always best. God's way is always best for us. And as you'll understand in a moment as I began to unpack this a little bit, you'll know that what God is showing the wife here is how to build her husband up, how to communicate better, how to have a better relationship with her husband. And he's showing some very practical ways to do it. Okay. So let's continue reading. It says, do not let your adorning be external. Now, once again, he's not suggesting that you should not fix your hair or put on makeup or wear jewelry or be stylish. In fact, um, we talked a little bit last week of of the the Hebrew word where uh, when God made the woman, he fashioned the woman. He just kind of squeezed out the man, two different words completely. And so, be feminine, be pretty, like that kind of stuff. That's okay. He's not suggesting that it's wrong or sinful to fix your hair. What he's saying is, there must be a greater emphasis on the hidden person of the heart. And we live in a culture that really promotes style over substance, don't we? I mean, there's so many people, they're just, they want to filter their pictures. I read about one woman, she had a big following on Instagram, 
And she was always talking about the beach life. And she took all these pictures with her in the sand. And come to find out, she was taking her pictures in the sandbox at her apartment building where her kids played. So a lot of times there is all of this emphasis on the outside, on the external. But God says, if you want to be happy in your marriage, if you want to have a good marriage, learn to emphasize the hidden person of the heart. Uh, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I'm going to explain that because I know some of the women just threw up in their mouth a little bit. Uh, He's like, if you think that I'm going to call my husband Lord, you're correct. Maybe Lord Voldemort, but not, not Lord. Uh, You need to understand the context and what was being said here. I'll explain it. Uh, It it will help you uh, to know. And it says, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, what does that mean? Uh, Does that mean that uh, you can't be afraid of spiders? I hope not because I don't like spiders. I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm not afraid of dogs. I'm not afraid of most things, but I'm afraid of spiders. I don't know why that is. I don't like spiders. Uh, So he's not suggesting that uh, you can't be afraid of a dog or you can't be afraid of a spider. But what he's saying is, and I'll explain this in a moment, how Sarah handled her fear was through her faith. I'll explain that in a little bit. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, once again, I believe every commandment in the Bible is doable. This may be the only exception for a husband to actually understand his wife. Um, That's a joke. Obviously, you did not think that was very funny, uh, but so I'll move on. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you. So he gave instructions to wives, to husbands. Now he says, everybody... Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. By the way, if you'll do that, you got to be unified as a couple. It doesn't mean, uh, unity does not mean uniformity. You don't have to like the same things. Kim and I like different kinds of movies for the most part. Um, Kim loves little trinkety, tiny little things she just says so, she just gushes over it, and I know she loves those things. I don't ever need that in my life at all. In fact, if we had no little tiny trinkets, I'm okay with that. But we don't have to be exactly alike. We are unique, we are individuals, but being in unity does not mean uniformity, okay? So he says that we're to have unity of mind, we're to have sympathy toward each other, we're to have brotherly love. In other words, acts of kindness. We're to have a tender heart. Sometimes when you've been married for a while, it becomes difficult to have a tender heart toward each other. When you first get married, you know how that is, right? When Kim and I first got married, I thought there was a rule that we had to sleep like two pretzels all up against each other. Now, you got to understand something. I am a hot sleeper. I sweat when I sleep. I do not know why. Maybe it's because almost all my dreams involve fighting. I do not know why that is. Uh, There may be something wrong with me, okay? Uh, But after Kim and I had been married for, I don't know, three months or so, we, you know, we were lovey-dovey, all pretzely up, you know. And finally one night, Kim says, would you get off of me? (laughs) She's like, I have not slept in three months. And it's okay. Uh, But the longer you get, the longer you stay married, the more difficult it is to have sympathy toward each other. You know, the the young couple that are first married, if the wife has a cough, the husband wants to help. 
He wants to get her medicine. Uh, after you've been married for 36 years, when she coughs, you're like, would you stop barking like a seal? <laughs> so you got to have sympathy, a tender heart, and humbleness. You've got to have a humble mind. In other words, you don't have to win out every time. You don't have to win every argument. So what he's saying. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called. Now, I want you to note this. If you don't get anything else in this message or this passage of Scripture today, if you'll get this part, you're going to be better at communicating. You're going to have a better marriage. If you'll make a commitment to bless each other with your words, just being kind. It will make a huge difference in your marriage if you'll bless. And God says you were called to this so that you may obtain a blessing. In other words, when you bless, you're going to get a blessing back. You want to learn how to communicate better. Uh, you're not going to know everything of what the other person wants all the time. But you can bless. And so... Um, so whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Being honest in marriage. Being honest in your communication. But once again, with compassion, with tenderness, with love. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Be a peacemaker is what he's saying. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, interestingly, he's quoting from Psalms uh, in that last part. But he's saying that God will turn his face against you if you do not learn how to communicate kindly and with love. If you don't learn how uh, to be a blessing, God says that when you do that, you're speaking evil, and God will turn his face from you. It does not mean that God doesn't love you. It does not mean that God will not forgive you. It does not mean that God has left you. But what it means is that you have rejected, listen to this, because this is worth the price of admission today, you have rejected the blessing that God has put on your marriage. How many people live in a marriage that is not blessed because they violate this one simple rule. They speak evil. Oh, it's not that they are evil in all their actions, but just with their words. They speak evil. They communicate in a cutting and harsh way. They communicate in a way that tears down the other person. They never build up. And so, you know what? Even if you're not a person that praises others easily, God says you work on this, and when you do, the blessing of God begins to come on your marriage. So I want to give you just a couple thoughts today of how you can communicate better and more clearly in your marriage. First of all, I want you to see what uh, Peter gave us here as the foundation for Christian communication. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, the verse is right before that. He said, likewise you're to do this. So what it tells me is right before, he said, do this in the same way as what I told you to do before. And the verse is right before 1 Peter 3, 1. It's in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. He says, for to this you have been called, talking to Christians, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither, listen, was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. That means caustic, cutting language. Jesus was mocked. He didn't mock back. They used hurtful sarcasm against him. He didn't use it back. That's a hard one for me. I'm so good at sarcasm. And maybe the way you were raised, or maybe something from your past, causes you to communicate in a certain way. But he said, likewise, the way Jesus communicated, in other words, 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to uh, him who judges justly. Uh, That's interesting. When he suffered, he did not threaten. How many times in marriage do we suffer something and we threaten? We threaten to abandon. We threaten to get a divorce. We threaten to leave. We threaten uh, to withhold sex. I mean, there are so many ways we threaten one another. Jesus did not do that. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the trees that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Once again, the word likewise in 1 Peter 3, 1, the first verse that we read, he's saying in this same way, here's how you learn to communicate with each other. You do it through the relationship with Jesus Christ. You do it by focusing on him. You do it by following his example. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep. Reflections of Isaiah 53. But have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So he's talking to this group of Christians and he says, Hey, I got some advice for you about how to communicate with one another. Both inspired by the Holy Spirit, but also some practical things. You know, I have been a married man, and I'm going to tell you some things you need to learn to do. And essentially what Peter is telling us is this. Before you do anything, you got to make sure that relationship with God is right. Because you got to put that first. Does that mean that every Christian uh, never has a problem with communicating in marriage? No, that's not what it means at all. In fact, he was uh, writing to committed Christians. But there are three things in this foundation. The foundation for communication is your relationship with Jesus Christ. First and foremost, that's the foundation. You want to learn how to communicate? Look at what Jesus did. He didn't revile. He didn't threaten. But he spoke blessing. You say, well, you don't understand. My husband, he's mean. Well, the way to make it better, according to what the Word of God says is not by retaliating, it's not by threatening, it's not by withdrawing, but rather it is by emulating what Jesus did for us. Um, The foundation for communication is faith. It's our relationship with Jesus, but it's also our faith. In other words, you've got to have faith that God can help you. Don't try to do it all on your own. Oh, you should make effort, but Trust God to help you. And then the communication, the foundation for communication is grace. So it's our relationship with God. It is our faith in him. And it is resting in the grace of God. The more aware you are of God's grace in your life, the more willing you are to give it to your spouse. And so that's the foundation. So before you try to fix anything, he says, get that foundation right. Here's the second thing I want you to see. This is instructions for wives. Now, he gives instructions for husbands, too, and we'll get to that in a minute. But ladies, listen. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to communicate respect. The Greek word to be subject to is a military term. And what it denotes is respect. Sarah called Abraham Lord. I I told you about that. And what that means is... She showed respect for him even when he did not deserve it. Now let that sink in. The biblical example was to show respect to the husband even if he doesn't deserve it. Some of you said, I thought I was marrying Prince Charming. Turns out I just married a couch that burps, you know. That's all I got. Well, if your husband deserves it or not. Learn to give respect because in doing so, you're going to build him up. You're going to meet an emotional need that you may not know that he has. And he's going to get better. He's going to get better. Uh, You see, Sarah called Abraham Lord. In other words, she wasn't being a doormat or bowing down to him. She was respecting him. Did you know that um, one of the things that he did was when they went to this area this new place, he said, oh, this is not my wife. This is my sister. 
He was doing it to cover his own rear end. He was afraid they were going to attack him uh, because she was so beautiful. And he goes, oh, no, no, this is my sister. Now, can you imagine how disrespected she felt? Can you imagine how insecure she felt that in her time of need, he wasn't there for her? But you know what she did? She respected him even when he didn't deserve it. Now, three times, if you think this is uh, what this means is that the wife is to bow down to the husband, that's not what it means at all. There is a partnership in marriage that the Bible is very clear about. Lots of preachers are good about pointing out where it says to the wife to be subject to your husband, uh, but they fail to mention that in almost every one of those contexts, it also says for the husband to be in submission to his wife. Did you know that in the Old Testament, there were three times it was recorded in Genesis that Abraham obeyed Sarah? Now, once again, this is not about who holds the big stick, but this is rather about communicating respect. Instructions for wives. Uh, Number two, you set the tone. When it says there that the wife uh, is to, to do this, she called Abraham Lord. What the Bible is teaching us is that the wife is the emotional hub of the family. Listen to Proverbs 19, 13. A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping. Now, that was from King Solomon, who had 700 wives and 300 concubines, okay? Um, And yet, even though he was the king, uh, he still was overwhelmed by, I guess, some wives that were like a constant dripping in in his ear, now, now, here's the point. The wife sets the emotional tone of the family. That's a godly thing. That's the way God created you. Now, uh, as we read in 1 Peter 3, um, where it told uh, the wife to win her husband, talking about a, a lost husband, one's not a Christian yet. She said, you're not going to win him by your words, but by your lack of words. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this, that you set the emotional tone, and if all you do is try to nag your husband about everything, that you're not going to reach your goal. I don't know of any man, and I've been in ministry a long time now, I don't know of any man that was ever nagged to Jesus. I I don't know of that. And um, one of the things that I learned a long time ago is that I have a mother, and one is enough. Now, my wife is a wonderful, wonderful woman. She's very, uh, follows scripture. She's very wonderful in how she handles me. Now, the truth of the matter is we have a partnership. And the truth is she learned a long time ago how to win me and to get me to do what needed to be done without beating me over the head. She knows that I don't respond to that. She knows that when she's like gets bowed up and I like, you know, telling me what I need to do, that I dig my heels in and I'm most likely going to do the opposite. Now, that's not a good trait to have. I'm not proud of that, but that's my nature. Now, um, she learned a long time ago how to handle me. Before we started this church, I traveled um, all over North America and Central America speaking and... um, I was gone over half the nights of the year in a hotel room. And we had small children at the time. They were young, and uh, the kids needed me, okay? And my wife, very brilliantly, rather than trying to make me feel bad about how I was gone so much, because that's what my ministry was, she just very quietly one day, she said, Richie, the kids really, really need you right now. And you know what I did? I was like, well, show me where. I'm like, that built me up. I was ready to charge hell with a water pistol, you know? I mean, because I was like, she was like, you know, you're strong. You can do this. You know what she did? She handled me brilliantly. She handled me biblically. She set the tone for our household. And then the final thing for the instruction for wives, be beautiful. Be beautiful. 
Uh, he's talking about the beauty of the inner person. Um, you know that this word being gentle, this gentle and quiet spirit, you know what it means? Literally in the Greek language, it means to tame wild animals. Now, now ladies, learn from this. Wives, learn from this. What he is saying here is that we all have this wild beast within us when it comes to communicating. We all want to lash out. We all want to have our way. We all at times are out of control. But you know what God said? You know what Peter wrote here? Learn to tame the beast. Now maybe your beast is that you're afraid as a result of that. You're worried as a result of that. What you do is you, you nag. Now, I don't mean to use an unpopular word, but that is a, uh, that's from the Greek, okay? No, I'm just kidding. It's not from the Greek, but um, that word describes that inner beast. And you know what God says? Tame the beast. Tame the beast. And when you do, you're going to meet your husband's emotional needs. And when that begins to happen, he will charge hell with a water pistol for you. Um, men have basically five basic emotional needs. Um, respect. Ladies, did you know that respect is at the top of your husband's emotional needs? Number one is sexual fulfillment. Number two is respect. My wife and I have talked about this. I love to hear her say, I love you. But if I never heard her say, I love you again, I don't ever think about it, to be honest with you. But if I know that she respects me, and that is what I need. And just because you have a different emotional need than your husband doesn't mean that you can meet his emotional needs in the way that your emotional needs would be met. Men have the need for respect. Domestic peace, that's where God wants the woman to set the tone in the, in the house. A beautiful spouse and by the way, do you want to know how to be beautiful? According to Scripture, it's focus on the inner person of the heart. That's the way you're beautiful. Because you know what? I'm learning this more and more every day. The older I get, the more difficult it is to look good, <laughs> you know? Kim was looking at my picture the other day. She goes, man, you look old. <laughs> I'm like, well, thank you. That's why I shaved the sides of my beard because I felt like that was uh, kind of making me look older. She's like, no, it's not just that. All right, so. But what a husband needs is that beautiful spouse that focuses on the inner person of the heart, a life partner that uh, does things with him, and then sexual fulfillment. So those are the five basic needs of the emotional needs of a woman. Uh, finally, ladies, God says, faith over fear. Where it says that if you're, uh, you know, God will bless you if you uh, behave like you're not afraid of any fear or whatever. Well, Sarah demonstrated faith even when he failed her. And so the point is this. You need to learn to conquer the fear through faith. Now, let's be honest. We all have fears. We're afraid that our spouse might leave us. We're afraid that somebody might found, find out what we're really like. We're afraid of all kinds of things. But God says, you want to be blessed? Learn to operate in faith rather than fear. And you'll be blessed. Now, point number three, instructions for husbands. What does God say to the men? specifically. Well, he says that we are to communicate security. The, the phrase there when it says you're to live together in an understanding way, uh, that Greek word means to live together without ever being separated and to share your goods with one another. That's what, that's what that word means. And you know what that communicates to a woman? One of her basic emotional needs is that domestic support. And so when you communicate in a way that lets her know that you're not going to leave her, you're going to be there for her, and you're going to help her no matter what, come hell or high water, Kim and I, when we got married, we made a pact 
that we weren't ever going to use the word divorce talking about each other. And I told her, I said, um, if you ever leave me, I'm coming with you. <laughs> now, we've never discussed divorce. We've both thought about murder a couple times, but <laughs> n- not divorce. But what does God tell the husband to communicate to his wife? Communicate security. Let her know that you're there for her. Then you got to learn how to communicate to her needs. To communicate in an understanding way. You know what that means, husbands? And listen up, because you may not like this. But it means to get to know what her needs are. It means to communicate in that way. Now, once again, I realize that men and women communicate differently. My wife wants details upon details upon details. She asks me questions that I never even thought to think And uh, she's like, how do you not know this? And I'm like, I don't know, you know? I mean, and I'm not making this up. Um, I played in a basketball league for about four or five years, played with the same guys, about 15 or 20 guys uh, that I knew. I played with three times a week, and I did not know any of their last names. I played for three years. And my wife was like, well, what are the, what, you know, what's their name? Oh, I don't know. His name's Al. What's his last name? I have no idea. I know what he does for a living, you know, and that's kind of the way men communicate. Get the first name, know what the guy does for a living, and you're good. You're covered, you know. She's like, she asked me stuff about him. I'm like, well, he's got a good jump shot, okay. I, I, other than that, I don't know. And, and so men and women are going to communicate differently. My, I, I heard an old preacher say this, men communicate in headlines, And women communicate in fine print. And I think that's true. But understand, you don't have a communication problem. You were able to communicate before you got married. You communicated well enough that you fell in love. So the idea is not that you don't know how to communicate. The idea is that we are living with unfulfilled and unrealistic expectations. So... Husbands learn to communicate to her needs. Just because you don't know all the details or don't care about all the details doesn't mean that she doesn't. Now, if you don't know, just be honest. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. What's going on with so-and-so? I, I, I don't know. How do you not know? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay? Learn to communicate to her needs. And then he tells us, always honor our spouse. So always honor your wife. And then he says, lead spiritual. This means that you're helping a woman with her emotional needs. Now, what are a woman's emotional needs? Essentially, they are affection. That's that romance. That's that uh, affection that you can express toward her. Clear communication. And God commands husbands to learn how to do that. I'm going to let you in on a secret. You're not going to be perfect on this. You're not going to get it right. And ladies, listen. Please do not buy into the modern idea of what a man should be. If you think that a man should be more like a woman, good luck with that. All right? That's all I'm going to say. Because if you think that your husband needs to sit around and sip lattes with you with his legs tucked under him while he watches The View or The Bachelor or whatever, I got some real bad news for you. He may not like women. All right, that's all I'm going to say. All right? And so don't think that what the modern idea of a man or woman is, is what's going to bring you happiness. It won't. It won't. I promise you. But husbands need to learn to communicate clearly, domestic support, appreciation. Every wife loves to be appreciated. Honesty and openness. I always question this one because women want you to be honest and open. They may not want honesty about everything in their life. But honesty and openness is one of a woman's emotional needs, family commitment, and spiritual leadership. Don't think 
that your wife does not want you to be involved spiritually. She does. She does. And that doesn't mean that you have to do exactly what she does. My wife loves a lot of these Bible studies. And uh, to be honest, that was one reason why it was so difficult for me to get in a small group because I had in my mind that small group was about sitting around staring at each other's belly button and discussing what somebody taught on a video for about an hour. And I'm like, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. Um, but thank God, small group is so much better than that and so much more than that. But she wants you involved. She wants you to lead spiritually. And then finally, God's communication plan for all. So he gave the foundation, instructions for wives, instructions for husbands. Now here's what he says that everyone, husband and wife alike, needs to have as their goals. Number one, have unified goals. Once again, that doesn't mean uniformity. But if you don't have the main things together and shared, you're going to have problems. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that Um, you really need to be married to another believer that's committed to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going to have difficulty. Now, he does show us how to deal with each other if you don't have a Christian spouse, okay? But he says we're to have unified goals. Those goals should be serving God, living out that life purpose together. You need to have the same basic philosophy of life doesn't mean that everybody has to be exactly alike. You may be a person that is frustrated if you don't know what you're going to spend three months from now on groceries. There are some people that are a little bit like that, uh, that are a little bit, uh, how should we say, anal retentive. All right, so um, there are some people that are like that. I'm just confessing, okay? The Bible says confession is good for the soul. I like to control things. I like to know where everything is spent. I go and look at stuff. In fact, did it just yesterday. Found some things on Kim's credit card that were being charged to her that should not be charged. She went and canceled it. We saved money. She was happy, okay? But maybe you're the kind of person that has no plan. Your idea of retirement is... Play the lottery more, all right? Um, and, and maybe you're not that detailed person, and it's okay. But you got to have the same goals. you got to have the same basic goals. You need to have unified goals. You need to bless. You know what the word bless means? It means to celebrate with praise. Celebrate with praise. And to build up. Don't use cutting evil language, but be direct and clear. Now, Ladies, let me help you with this. Be direct and clear with your man, okay? It will help him. It does him no good if he has no clue what you're talking about, okay? Now, I remember Kim, when we were earlier in our marriage, she would say things, she would drop hints, thinking that I got hints, okay? And uh, I don't get hints, okay? Okay? I need to be hit between the eyes with a ball-peen hammer, all right? That's what gets my attention, all right? Directness. And uh, she would say things like, I wish somebody would take out the garbage. And I'm like, me too. Good night. (laughs) Wish somebody would take it out. And, you know, she was asking me, essentially, but she wasn't direct. And so then she got better, and then I would be watching a game or something. She'd say, hey, Richie, take out the garbage. I'm like, okay. Now, what I meant was, as soon as the game was over, I was going to take it out. I wasn't going to, like, you know, let it sit there for six months. I was going to do it, okay? But that's not what she wanted, so she'd get angry at me, all right? So what she had to learn to do was one of two things. Richie, look at me. Take out the garbage, right now, okay? Or, better yet, she would tie it up and get it out of the can and hand it to me and say, walk this out right now, please. All right, you see the difference? Okay, don't be vague, but be clear in your communication. And actually, that's what the Bible commands. 
That word bless, it means those two things. You're to celebrate with praise and you're to uh, build up each other. In other words, be direct. Don't be vague about it. Learn how to celebrate with praise. And then finally, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Now here in conclusion today, um, it's impossible to communicate this way on your own. You need faith. So trust God. You need the Holy Spirit. Now there's a lot of content here, but today, here's what I'm going to do. This is my assignment for everyone today. Okay, just one thing that I want you to do. If you try to go tackle all this at once, you're probably not going to do it. But there's one thing, one thing you can do. And here's what I want you to do. Start praying together every day. It doesn't have to be long. But pray together every day. And at the end of your prayer, say something that praises and builds the other person up. Man, I love you. You are... um, Out of all the people in the world, I'm so blessed that God gave you to me. Something like that. I just want you to know how awesome you are and fill in the blank of what he or she's awesome at at doing. So that's the assignment. Pray together. Doesn't have to be long. Can start your day, can end your day, it can be over lunch. Who cares? Pray together. And at the end of your prayer, say something nice to each other. Build the other person up. And and once again, the more you do this, the more you can get into something that really is meaningful and matters to the other person. Um, You know, your hair looks nice is great, but when you begin to compliment a person's character, that is better. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.